Um, okay. Continue. All right. Um, I wanted to introduce you guys. I'm very excited about having David Higgins here tonight. Um, clay pipes can be very useful in dating early historic sites. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, but the, the bore of the clay pipe can actually tell you a date range for the clay pipe. So that's why archaeologists are always very excited about finding any kind of clay pipes. This is a, a replica of what I'm talking about. So um, this is one example of a clay pipe, but oftentimes what we find is just the stem itself. Now there's different theories about why they break off the, um, the stem. I've heard a number of different ones. I don't know if David's gonna talk about that tonight, but uh, in the North, um, in the Mid-Atlantic region, they've also found the pipe stems that have been used as beads um, by people, very clever people that have repurposed this kind of thing where they've polished them and used them as beads. Um, they've also been used as whistles. If you can, if you get a good portion and they notch it, they use it as whistles. And they've been used, if you heat them up, you can actually curl your hair with them. So there's different things that they have, they get repurposed for. Um, I have to read this because David has so many things going on. So uh, Dr. David Higgins is a British archaeologist with a special research interest in identification analysis of clay tobacco pipes. He has spent more than 40 years studying the subject and has published more than 400 papers on pipes in local, national, and international journals. He has made two study tours to look at collections of excavated material from Maryland and Virginia and has written special reports on a number of other pipe groups from the Americas, such as Panama and the Caribbean. Dr. Higgins is currently a research fellow at the University of Liverpool in the UK, and he holds the following posts. He is the chairman of the National Park Pipe Archive. He is the chairman of the Society for Clay Pipe Research, and he is the secretary of the Academy Internationale de la Pipe. So without further ado, um, very happy to have Dr. Higgins here and uh, please take it away. All right, thank you very much. I'll see if I can do battle with the uh, technology and uh, get it up and running. Uh, can, can you see that or did I still need to do something else? Can we minimize? Your screen is not shared. All uh, right, hang on a second. I'll see if I can get that. Yes. Share screen. Right. There you go. Let's try try this again. Double click. That's it. And that. And then if you minimize yes, that. we can see that now. There's that. There's that appeared up now. Minimize that. Yes. Good. Right. We've got the uh, got the technology got the technology up and running. Um, right. Yeah. Well, thank you for um, joining us this evening. Um, what I'd like to do today is to talk to you a bit about um, British clay pipes that are found in the Chesapeake Bay region, um, because obviously that's the uh, the area that's going to be of most interest to you. Um, clearly, uh, on sites in the, the region, you find a, a mixture of pipes. Um, the Dutch were sending pipes uh, across the Atlantic as well, and there was some local production as well. But I'd like to just focus on um, some aspects of the British uh, pipes that were coming across and try and show you how, um, by understanding in a bit more detail um, how and where these pipes were made and marked, um, they can be used to interpret the, um, the archaeological deposits you find them in in a bit more detail and look at where um, trade goods are coming from um, in the transatlantic trade. So the English uh, are well known for their smoking habits. Um, right from the earliest days after the discovery of America, uh, smoking became very, very popular in England and wherever the British went, uh, all around the world, they tended to take the habit of smoking with them. And uh, here's just a, 
a typical scene you see in many of the old paintings and engravings uh, of people enjoying a drink and a, a pipe. Uh, and they're all busy waving these long stemmed pipes around, which were uh, fashionable at the time. And uh, going back to what um, Ilka was saying about the, uh, the pipes themselves, I don't think uh, they did break the ends off them. This I think is a bit of a, an urban myth that gets put around. Uh, basically you, the pipes that are, are found tend to be broken simply because pipes are very fragile. And if you look at almost any old picture or engraving uh, that shows the floor, you'll see it littered with bits of broken pipe where people have simply broken them um, during the, the course of waving them around uh, in the evening. So uh, this is how they would have been smoked as quite long stemmed pipes, uh, particularly uh, in English contexts. So just to sort of set the scene a bit, um, obviously uh, you're based here in the Chesapeake Bay region uh, in the, the middle of North America uh, and Britain sits uh, across on the, the edge of Europe and was ideally placed to provide the trade goods that came across and we find uh, English pipes all the way from Canada up in Newfoundland um, at the various fishing sites all the way down the east coast uh, and right into the, the Caribbean, uh, the number of sites there have produced quite large quantities of English pipes and probably they carried on right down into South America as well and across uh, into Africa, uh, but there's been so little work in some of these areas, it's not really possible to uh, give the same amount of precision that we can do for the, the better excavated sites uh, from North America. But the, uh, the trade in pipes became very significant uh, with very large numbers of pipes being produced in Britain and used as trade goods, uh, both with the, the native uh, American people um, and as part of the slave trade as well, pipes were being used um, as part of the exchange mechanism for, for the, the slave trade with Africa. Now, uh, in Britain, the main sources of pipes that come across tend to be on the, the west side of the country. And um, I've shown just on this map some of the, the key places that we'll be mentioning. Um, up in Scotland, you've got Glasgow and Edinburgh uh, were both pipe producing centres. And from the 17th century onwards, we find pipes from there uh, making the, the trip across the Atlantic. Uh, Whitehaven up in the uh, northern English coast uh, was another centre which developed uh, during the late uh, 17th and into the 18th centuries, a lot of trade in tobacco uh, went through Whitehaven and pipes were certainly being produced from there for export as well. Then uh, Liverpool and Chester are interesting because these are, are two cities that are very close to one another in the northwest of England and uh, Chester is the older centre, it's a, a Roman settlement that has carried right on through the medieval period and was a very important port uh, throughout that, uh, that period. But during the post-medieval period, the, the river started to silt up and with larger ships wanting to make the, the journey across the Atlantic, uh, Liverpool then grew. And so you get these two centres, which are only about 20 miles or so apart, but actually have really quite uh, different and quite interesting pipe making traditions. Um, Bristol, uh, down in the southwest, is obviously one of the best known ports. It was one of the, the major ports that was servicing the Atlantic trade. But we also find other places down in the southwest of England, um, such as Exeter and Plymouth, uh, down here at the bottom, which uh, were also engaged in the trade across the Atlantic. And of course, London, um, as the capital, a lot of shipping came and went from London. But as you can see, London is on the the wrong side of the country really. The, the main ports that were engaged in the transatlantic trade uh, tended to be on the west side uh, because the, it was easier to get across the, the winds and the conditions were right to get across the Atlantic. Um, whereas on the east coast of England, the trade was mainly across to the Baltic and to the continent. So I'd like to just look at um, three or four of the main British centres and try and show you what sorts of pipes were being there, uh, made there, and then go on to look at how these turn up uh, in Maryland and Virginia and how they can be used to try and understand uh, the trade in pipes across the Atlantic. So we'll start with having a look at London, um, which was one of the earliest pipe producing centres um, and it has been very well studied archaeologically. And so it's been possible to 
build up a typology of the bowl forms that were being produced by the London pipe makers running right through from around the 1580s with these very small varieties um, at the top and then running right through uh, into the 19th century uh, and indeed pipe production continued in London right through into the 1950s before the last pipe makers there um, closed up their businesses. The early pipes were all um, rather barrel shaped in form and they have um, rather small bowls because initially tobacco was um, a very expensive import into Britain and it was only really after the, uh, the plantations got established from the 1620s onwards uh, that the price of tobacco started to drop considerably and pipe bowls responded by becoming larger so that more tobacco could be smoked and you can see this um, the left-hand part of this typology really, uh, they're mainly barrel-shaped forms and they, they generally get larger during the course of the 17th century. And it, it's very noticeable that the, uh, the change in size um, was very uniform. That If you find a, a closely dated deposit or, or group of pipes, um, they all tend to be very, very much the same size. And if you find one that's 10, 15 years later, they're all a little bit bigger. And so the, the size is very important uh, in pinning down the date of these early forms from, from London, which otherwise uh, look fairly similar. Towards the end of the 17th century, there was a change. Uh, the bowl forms become longer um, and slightly more elongated, and then they turn upright um, with this form, the number 25 here, which um, is, becomes the standard type that was used throughout the 18th century. Um, we get some with rather sort of flat heels, others with more pointed spurs, uh, and then the forms go through into the 19th century when they become uh, rather diverse and so typology can't cope very well with all the, the different forms but the, uh, the basic types um, still maintain some of these earlier features. So the, the dating of these has been fairly well established uh, and these are the forms that we find in London. If we look at them uh, in a bit more detail you can see how the makers started to mark their pipes um, the earliest ones, uh, these small bowl forms from the early 17th century, often just have symbol marks on them. Um, so we tend to find um, rosettes and wheels or star marks um, rather than initials. But as you go through the 17th century, um, the makers tend to put their initials um, usually in relief, often with a decorative border on the pipes. And towards the end of the 17th century, with these large, more elongated forms, um, you sometimes find the mark placed on the back of the bowl facing the smoker. Um, and on this particular one, it's on both the bowl and on the heel of the pipe. And this placing of a, a mark on the, the back of the bowl um, becomes quite common in the, the later pipes from London. Um, but it starts towards the, as I say, towards the end of the 17th century. And here again, you can see an example where there's an ER mark on the bowl and then the same initials uh, on the, the heel itself. So the makers are identifying themselves, but there was, there was no um, obligation to do so. Uh, unlike the Dutch pipes where the guild registered marks and you had to have a, a specific registered mark to enable you to make pipes. Um, it was a bit of a free for all in London and not all the pipes uh, are marked. A lot of the 17th century ones are plain and that can make it quite difficult to identify them uh, if they don't have a mark on them. And this is where it becomes important to recognize the different regional bowl forms that are being produced. As we go through into the 18th century, um, they started using decoration on the bowl and one of the key types of decoration that was popular during the, the 18th century were the uh, royal coats of arms. And so we find the, the Hanoverian arms um, with the lion and unicorn supporters um, on either side uh, are quite, quite popular during this period, um, as are the Prince of Wales feathers with the three plumes. So um, this is the earliest sort of decoration we find. It starts from around the, the 1730s or 1740s onwards. Uh, and these seem to be particularly associated with taverns. And certainly at Williamsburg, um, quite large numbers have been found in some of the tavern deposits from there. So there does seem to be a link 
um, with them. These particular ones um, come from the moat of the Tower of London, um, but interestingly, they were found um, in an area of the moat just outside where uh, there was a, an, an inn or tavern uh, that was used by the warders at the tower. So again, there may be a link um, between drinking and these um, patriotic pipes with the royal coats of arms on. Um, as we go to the end of the 18th century into the 19th century, uh, the marks continued to be particularly on the bowl, and we find these, they now have the surname put on, so got Jones and Ford, um, two of the big makers in London with their, their names on the bowl, and their initials uh, still moulded on the sides of the heel or spur underneath. And then sometimes in the 19th century, they start to add a bit of an address as well. Um, so we've got Balm at Mile End and Ford and Stepney um, up, are on the pipes. And sometimes you just find the coat of arms. This is the London coat of arms with St George's Cross and a sword in the top quarter. Uh, and that turns up on quite a number of pipes as well. So the, the styles of marking change over time, um, as do the bowl forms. Uh, and then they also start to become much more decorative in the 19th century with quite large numbers of these, these pipes with uh, Masonic decoration uh, was very popular, but then um, a wide variety of other themes come in and by the end of the 19th century, all sorts of things were being put on pipes to, uh, to decorate them. Uh, the London makers in the 19th century also tended to put their name and address on the stem of the pipe. Uh, most of these are broken off, but um, this would be Russell from Wapping and uh, Smith from Wapping. You can see the, the parts of the makers' names uh, on the stems of these pipes. So those are pipes from, from London and the sorts of things they're making there. Um, so we'll then have a, a quick look at Bristol um, across the other side of the country. And as I say, one of the main supply sources that were sending pipes across the Atlantic. The, the early pipes from Bristol um, are very similar to those from London. You get the a sort of a barrel shaped form, uh, such as numbers one and two here. But the, the thing about pipes from Bristol, they, they tend to be a little bit more dr drawn up. The bowls are, are slightly longer and more elongated. And then by the middle of the century, you get these um, very curved forms. Uh, these two at the bottom uh, made by members of the Hunt family. Uh, this one on the left uh, says Flower Hunt, um, who was actually a, a male pipe maker with a slightly unusual uh, Christian name of Flower, uh, and a John Hunt. And um, you can see the, the very curved form to these bowls. And this was very typical of central southern England and the West Country. So you can see that um, different parts of the country were making very different shapes of pipe. And the, the, um, the fathers in Bristol uh, who were running the, the city uh, were very keen to encourage pipe making. And we find around the middle of the 17th century, a lot of pipe makers um, were admitted as freemen to the city and they seem to have been encouraging pipe makers to establish themselves. And Bristol then became a very, very substantial pipe making center, um, shipping huge quantities of pipes across the Atlantic. The marks that turn up on them um, are shown here in black, and that indicates that they're incuse marks where the lettering is um, impressed into the clay rather than being relief marks like uh, the ones from London, which are shown in drawings in outline to indicate the difference. So um, although they're still using initials on the pipes like the IT and RB, um, the, the nature of the marks is different. So you can uh, tell that you've got a, a pipe from a different part of the country. As we come through to the later 17th century in Bristol, um, the bowls become rather um, bigger and more chunky in form, but they still keep this very curved um, profile, uh, which is, is different from the, the ones that are being made in London at the same time. And the maker's marks on them uh, continue to be impressed. So um, we have WE uh, as an incuse mark, uh, RN, RT, these are all uh, impressed into the clay with um, incised lettering. Uh, which uh, distinguishes Bristol. It's the, the particular style they favoured there. Around 1660, um, the makers in Bristol also started decorating the stems of their pipes. And we find these um, zones of decoration, um, which are, are called roll stamped stems because the decoration was engraved onto a little metal plate. And then the pipe 
um, well, this, this plate was then used to roll around the stem of the pipe uh, when it was still soft, having been moulded, and it imparted the decoration on the, to the, the stem. And you can often see a, a gap like here where the, uh, the two ends haven't quite met up. And these geometric designs are very, very typical uh, of the pipes made in Bristol at this period, um, and particularly for pipes that were made for export. Um, these particular examples come from Charlestown and Nevis in the Caribbean, uh, and they're, again, they're, they're very, very common um, right down the, the east coast of America, uh, whereas in this country, they're very, very rare. We very rarely find these decorated stems, even though we would know they were being made in huge numbers in Bristol, um, because they were on types of pipes that were being made specifically for the export market, um, which just shows how important it, it was considered uh, in Bristol at the time. The Bristol makers um, also put marks on the back of the bowl in the same way as the London ones. Um, but again, these marks are um, in size, they're set into the clay, um, so they're, they're slightly different in, in nature. And then when we come through into the early 18th century, um, another regional form of decoration appears, which are these moulded cartouche marks. So um, these letters on the sides of the bowl um, in a little raised circle um, are part of the mould itself. They're imparted as the pipe is moulded rather than being stamped on with a separate die afterwards. And this is a very characteristic style of marking that we find uh, in the West Country, the, the West of England, and particularly um, in and around Bristol. Uh, so if you find this style of marking uh, on your pipes, you know that the, the pipe you're looking at comes from that part of the country. And here's just a, a photograph to show what one of these pipes um, would look like. <clears throat> this, uh, well, these two um, are both made by Robert Tippett. Um, you can see his name broken up in the cartouche on the side. There's an R at the top and then T-I-P-P-E-T. -P -P -E um, hasn't moulded very well there, but um, that's the name on the side. And then he's also stamped his initials on the back of the bowl for good measure as well. So we've got the initials R-T, uh, on the pipe and his full name molded. So uh, they were clearly identifying uh, who were making the pipes. And certainly in Bristol, we tend to find a higher number of pipes being marked during the 17th century uh, than in London. So um, in London, maybe only one in 10 or one in 20 pipes has a mark on it. Whereas in, in Bristol, uh, nearly all of them have marks on. And again, this is important to remember because when you're looking at assemblies of pipes, um, the Bristol ones tend to jump out at you because they, they tend to be marked and you know who they are and where they're from. Whereas the ones from London can hide away a bit because they're often not marked. And so you have to be aware of what the different bowl forms look like and which part of the country they might have come from. As we go through the 18th century, um, Bristol pipes become rather taller with thinner walls and finer spurs underneath. And then in the same way as in London, they start using moulded decoration <clears throat> towards the end of the 18th century. Uh, initially with the um, fluted decoration was very, very popular. But then uh, as we go through into the 19th century, uh, a wide range of other geometric um, and decorative designs were being produced. And uh, here's some examples of some 19th century ones from, from Bristol. Now, the um, other interesting thing to note about the pipes from um, Bristol is that the, the maker's initials are molded on the sides of the spur uh, or the heel in the same way as in London. Um, but in this case, they're placed upright. So this, um, this pipe number 40 has IW uh, underneath and this one has got JW, but the, the lettering is placed vertically rather than horizontally. And so again, that's another little thing to look out for that the, the makers in London um, didn't really use uh, the, the vertical uh, placement. And it's quite rare in Britain. Uh, it is mainly just from um, Bristol and one or two places uh, in the Welsh borders that we find this style of lettering being used. So if we move further on up the coast um, to Chester um, and look at some of the pipes from there, you'll see that, uh, again, um, each different place has its own different style 
and um, this is how you can then start to recognize where pipes are coming from in your assemblages. Um, as I say, Chester was an important port in the medieval period. It was a, a very big centre, a very important regional centre, but the river is not particularly wide. It's uh, quite a narrow uh, river at this point. And so as the shipping got bigger um, and as the river silted up as well, the, the coastline here was building up and the estuary became longer and longer. Uh, and the larger ships simply couldn't get into Chester. So as I say, did decline uh, in importance during the post-medieval period as a, as a trading centre. Now the early pipes from, <coughs> from Chester um, tend to look very similar to the ones from London uh, in that you get this rather barrel-shaped form um, that uh, 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 appears on them. Uh, and the marks are also somewhat similar. You find some of these wheel marks and star marks um, being used and if initials do occur they're rather simple and so it can be quite difficult to um, tell whether you've got a, a London pipe or a Chester pipe um, from the earliest period. But as you go through the 17th century um, as with most parts of Britain you find very strong regional styles um, emerging and in Chester these rather um, elongated sweeping forms become uh, very typical uh, of the pipes that are being produced there, um, sometimes with a, a rather large flared heel underneath. So uh, this one here is a little tail at the back of it, but the, the heel flares out quite considerably. And sometimes these have little ribs um, on them as well, which uh, is another distinctive characteristic uh, of the pipes that you find in Chester. Looking at some of the, the maker's marks there, I say they're very similar to ones you find um, from other parts of the country. And so um, in this case, it comes down to, to recognising particular marks, um, such as these um, marked NE, the NE maker. We're not sure who he was, um, but he clearly worked in Chester and lots and lots of different marks um, with the initials usually ligatured together like this um, turn up in lots of different varieties. So. Um, again, if you can actually get into looking at the marks themselves and recognising which makers were working in which place, that can be a, a, a good help in identifying where pipes are, are coming from. The um, key thing, though, about the Chester pipes is the use of the stem decoration, uh, which starts towards the end of the 17th century, uh, and I suppose in a way similar to the sort of thing they were doing in Bristol. But um, whereas the Bristol makers used just fairly um, simple geometric borders, sometimes with their initials or name in them, uh, the Chester makers very rarely used their name, but they had a, a very, very wide range of decorative borders, which ranged from these rather simple um, lattice borders to ones with stars and circles and then more um, ornate combinations um, of different varieties um, and, and you get a whole series of different ones as you come through into the 18th century. Um, these with a, a heart star and fleur-de-lis um, form a, a particular series with quite a lot of different varieties turning up and you find tendrils and flowers and things and these um, borders tended to be used in pairs um, often with a, an oval, um, decorative oval in between them and the um, arrangement of them, um, I hope you can see this, I think the, I'm not sure if I can get rid of that thing at the top of the screen, but the the um, the stems of these pipes um, were decorated, this one here has got two just fairly simple uh, milled borders and then some fleur-de-lis stamps uh, on top of the stem and this one again has got a couple of borders running around it and then an animal um, oval on the stem uh, and occasionally you just find a single border but normally they come in pairs and sometimes with three or four uh, running down the stem and these pipes um, the engraving on the designs was very very fine and this is probably because Chester was an important gold and silversmithing centre and so they had skilled craftsmen there who could make finely engraved dies and we know that these um, pipes were held in quite high esteem and we find orders for them coming from um, all across the country uh, and you know people making particular reference to the Chester pipes because they're um, so so fine in quality. As I say Chester was only just down the road from Liverpool uh, and here's a picture of the Liverpool waterfront 
Um, this is during the excavations for the new museum of Liverpool. Uh, and you can see here a pair of old dock gates leading into one of the former docks, which is now all uh, reclaimed ground um, at the waterfront that the museum has been built on. Uh, and because Liverpool was able to handle much, much bigger ships and they built these um, very extensive docks, it grew very, very rapidly as a, uh, a port and the pipe makers followed uh, the, the shipping. And so we find on the little streets uh, in the city, which runs up uh, behind the library building here, um, pipe makers workshops dotted around very close to the waterfront and providing um, pipes for export. And the hinterland of Liverpool, only a, a sort of 10 or 12 miles away inland, uh, is a place called Rainford. And Rainford was a, a very important potting centre. Lots of um, black glazed uh, pottery and slipwares and things were being produced there and exported. Um, and they all came through Liverpool as the, the nearest port. But they also made a lot of pipes there. So we have a, um, an area from Liverpool across to Rainford, which is all in the modern county of Merseyside, um, where they were also making pipes just uh, 20 miles or so from Chester. But the pipes from this region are, are rather different. The um, heel forms they were making tend to have a much more bulbous look to them. Uh, you can see maybe particularly on this one here, the, the bowls were quite large and chunky with a very rounded um, form, um, which is perhaps more obvious when you're handling them, and, and you can see they're, they're very bulbous, these pipes. Uh, and the maker's marks tend to have um, initials with a, a ring around them uh, on the, the base of these. And sometimes they were copying the styles from Chester. Um, this type here has got these little ridges on the heel, which, um, as I mentioned before, was a, a characteristic of Chester pipes. But the rest of the bowl form um, is more typical of Rainford. And so we're finding very different styles of pipe emerging um, at the same time. These are still 17th century ones, um, but in two centres very, very close to one another. Um, the spur forms that were being made there uh, follow the same sort of pattern. They have these very bulbous, rounded forms, but these tend to have um, the marks on the, the back of the bowl. And the marks that they, they used in Rainford were very distinctive. Uh, they were little crescent-shaped marks um, with a little sort of fleur-de-lis flourish on the top of them. Um, like this one, bottom number eight here, a sort of a, a semicircular crescent over the top. And then this is usually a little fleur de lis uh, on the top of it. But the, uh, the maker's marks again become quite distinctive to the area. Uh, and IB becomes a very, very common mark in Rainford. And we're not sure if this is because there were lots of pipe makers there with the initials IB or whether it became a, a sort of a, a brand mark for that particular production centre. But uh, certainly uh, it was an important centre that made lots of pipes and they were widely traded throughout the northwest of England um, and the Irish Sea across into Ireland. Uh, and they also do turn up in small numbers uh, in America. The um, pipe makers in the start of the 18th century in Rainford uh, also decorated their stems. Um, but you can see that the stem decoration they used was very different from either the um, Bristol or the Chester makers. Um, they tend to have these very wide borders, usually with the, the maker's name across the middle of it, um, with rows of uh, ser serrations and then little sort of heart-shaped motifs at the edge. Um, sometimes with um, other animals in as well. This one has got little um, animal heads and birds and things in the border um, and Rainford added as well uh, to it. So different different styles of stem decoration um, appearing. And this, this um, range of marks um, seems to extend into Liverpool as well. This is an early Liverpool pipe with the initials RA on the bowl. And um, there's, he's using the same crescent shaped um, mark uh, as you find from Rainford itself. And towards the end of the 18th century, the Liverpool makers started using um, long single name stamps on their st the stems of their pipes. And they normally consist of the maker's name. And here we've got W. Morgan and then the place Liverpool. 
uh, and these are applied, these are not molded marks, these are, are different from the later 19th century marks that you find that are made in the mold. Um, these were added with a long single line stamp and this particular style of marking is very characteristic um, of the northwest of England and if you find a part of one of these stamp marks uh, you can be pretty sure it's come from that part of the world and not anywhere else. The um, mark stems are associated with these decorative bowls um, and you find in particular um, a series with stags heads on the back facing the smoker and then a bird motif and this is the liver bird which is the symbol of Liverpool uh, and we find these in very large numbers of lots of different designs um, and They've turned up in, in quite some numbers at Yorktown um, from the uh, War of Independence deposits there. So um, we know that they were certainly being exported um, from Liverpool uh, across to America uh, at the end of the 18th century. <clears throat> in the 19th century, um, the makers started to put, use a little shield mark on the back of the bowl, and this is molded um, on so they'd have their initials and again a much wider range of marks um, occurring and they also started to cater specifically for um, export markets. This particular one here has the stag's head on again which is a, a typical motif for Liverpool but this arrangement of motifs here with a bird in a tree and a bell and that's supposed to be a fish through it um, is actually the the arms for Glasgow and so it looks like they were making export pipes for Scotland um, from Liverpool as well and um, we can also see that pipes were being made for the American market um, because this particular one at the bottom from a kiln group in Rainford has got a series of stars across it um, representing the uh, original states of the Union and we find these pipes being produced uh, at the end of the 18th century very quickly after the War of Independence and the pipe makers seem to have cashed in fairly quickly on making pipes um, for the American market. And the other thing to notice is that this, this particular bowl is much bigger um, than all the others in this group. And this again seems to be a, a particular characteristic uh, of the exported pipes that the um, export market to America demanded much, much bigger pipe bowls than for the home market. And here <coughs> are a pair of, of um, export pipes dating from the late 18th century, um, which occur in two different sizes. Um, the big one at the top, um, which has got the American Eagle and Liberty on it. And then uh, the same design in a slightly smaller version. And again, these come from kiln dumps in Rainford, uh, showing that they were being produced for the uh, American market at this date. The kiln groups that we've got from Liverpool also show this size difference. These um, pipes uh, A and B at the top are much larger than the other ones. And these were being made again for export. And the interesting thing is that none of these um, have a heel or spur on them. These are all um, the spurless type, which wasn't being used in this country at the time. This is a, a late 18th century group. And we don't find this style of pipe really until about uh, the middle of the 19th century in England. So um, we know straight away that all of these pipes were being made for export and in particular um, for the American market. Now the, the use of um, these spurless pipes goes back quite a long way um, and we can find it going back uh, through adverts and things. Here's a, a nice advertisement for Bristol pipes from 1799. And it starts off with all the, the long pipes, and these are the everyday pipes that would be used in this country. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't say how long they are, but you can tell from the prices uh, that they're considerably more expensive than the shorter ones. And all the short pipes are listed for different overseas markets. So here they're listing short pipes for the West India markets and short pipes for the different American markets and short pipes for the Irish and Spanish markets. So um, they also made pipes for Africa and any other market. So they were clearly making specific pipes um, for the specific overseas markets um, by the end of the 18th century. Uh, and in fact, this goes right back to the start of the 18th century. Um, <coughs> the Bristol pipe makers in 1710 um, drew up some regulations as to how long the various types of pipe they were making should be. Uh, 
So they were making long pipes that were 16 inches, Dutch pipes were 14 inches, but the Jamaica pipes are only 13 inches, and then penned heels and gauntlets, which we think are the spur pipes, and gauntlets were um, pipes with a, originally made by the gauntlet family down in Wiltshire, but um, they became very famous and the name, I think, then became attached to almost any pipe with a, a, a little gauntlet stamp on it. But then at the bottom, um, of particular interest to yourselves, were the Virginia pipes, which were the shortest they were making at just eight and a half inches. And um, recent work that's been done by Andy Kincaid uh, in Virginia has identified the uh, specific type of pipe that this represents. And this is an example um, that was found at uh, the Locust Grove landing stage um, of a complete pipe. And it has uh, indeed, as the regulations from 1710 said, uh, a stem length of about eight and a half inches. Uh, and it's one of these spurless export types. So we can now say that these were known as Virginia pipes. Uh, and they were made specifically for the um, markets in Virginia and Maryland, which is where they turn up in the largest numbers. Um, this particular one was made by one of the Robert Tippets of Bristol, um, who were a, a major pipe making family working from the end of the 17th century right through into the 18th century. <clears throat> and again, we've seen one of his pipes before with the initials RT stamped on it. I think this particular form can actually be traced right back to the earliest pipe making activity uh, in America. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Robert Cotton, one of the famous um, early inhabitants at Jamestown, um, where he arrived in 1608 and started making pipes. And the pipes he was making uh, are not at all like the pipes that we've seen from the various English centres. Um, they have this forward-leaning bowl uh, and a, a strange angled um, sort of bowl form and stem junction, uh, which is actually very similar to the native Indian pipes that were being made at the same time. Uh, these also come from the Jamestown Fort excavations, but these are uh, Native American pipes. And if you put the two together, um, the Native American one at the top and one of uh, Robert Cotton's at the bottom, you can see how very similar uh, these two types are. And so I think that this particular type of export pipe can be dated right back to the beginning of the 17th century, um, and in fact to pipe making in Jamestown, where these spurless forms were being made, um, presumably either just copying the local Indian pipes or for trade with them. And from this time onwards, um, this became the the favoured type of pipe that was being used in Maryland, Virginia, um, and this is what the pipe makers went on to produce in England uh, for export, um, specifically to this part of the world. And if we go back to this map of Britain, um, we know that pipe makers uh, in Edinburgh and Glasgow and Whitehaven and Liverpool, probably in Chester, certainly in Bristol, certainly in Plymouth, probably Exeter and certainly in London, were all making these spurless types in the 17th century uh, just for the export market because we don't find them um, in this country. Uh, and they were not for any export market because when you go down to the Caribbean, although they do occur there, they occur in much, much smaller numbers uh, than in Maryland, Virginia. So these were particular pipes that were being targeted um, for the Chesapeake Bay area market. And if we look at one or two kiln groups, <clears throat> there's a, a kiln group here from Plymouth in Devon, um, dating from around 1660 to 1680. And this is the range of bowl forms um, that one particular maker was producing, which are mainly just plain local styles of bowl. But in amongst them is this export style. Um, so he was clearly making, although he was only a small manufacturer with a small range of products, uh, he was clearly trying to get in uh, on this export market um, by the third quarter of the 17th century. And we find the same thing if we look at a, another group from Plymouth. Um, this group dates from around <coughs> sorry, 1690 to 1730. And again, uh, local forms of bowl with a strong curved local style, but in amongst them is an export style. So clearly this maker was also had his eye on the export market. And we're finding these small workshops 
um, up and down the country, if we can find these kiln groups, uh, is the only place that these, these particular forms turn up. And we know that they were also made up in Scotland um, because when the Scots tried to set up uh, their trading settlement in Panama, um, which was a, an ill-fated venture that only lasted a couple of years right at the end of the 17th century, um, they ordered pipes to be made and they sent specifically down to London and Bristol for samples of pipes that were suitable uh, for the trade that they were intending in Panama. And these pipes here um, were recovered from the site of the Darien colony um, at Fort St Andrew in Panama. And they were made in Scotland. They've got Scottish pipe makers initials on them, but they've got these spurless forms. Um, and we know that they, they ordered a total of 600,000 pipes um, for this particular venture. So they were clearly uh, intending to trade on a very substantial scale. The other thing that's worth noting here is the um, the maker's marks. The, there are some heeled pipes as well that turned up in Panama, and the the makers in Scotland tend to use a little castle mark. It's uh, not very clear, but this little device in the middle of the mark is intended to be a castle, uh, and on either side of it, the maker's initials, and that's a, a distinctive style of Scottish mark. So, having looked at some of the different production centres in um, Britain, I hope you can see that the the styles of pipes that were being made in different places were very different. And if you can start to recognise the different styles of bowl form and mark, um, this then helps you to interpret the pipes that turn up on archaeological deposits uh, in America. So here, for example, um, are some pipes from excavations in Maryland, um, and they are immediately recognisable as products from Bristol because we have the incuse uh, initials on the back of the bowl and these geometric um, stem borders uh, and of course they're both export style pipes. So we can see here pipes from Bristol um, turning up uh, in Maryland uh, and this is the specific style that they were making for that particular market. You do have to be a bit careful because uh, there's another example here which also has uh, an export style um, bowl to it. Um, but the, the stem mark is a bit different. Unfortunately, it's not all drawn here, but the, the stem mark has the, the initials AA in the centre and then two X's, one at either end. Um, now, say this type of pipe doesn't turn up very often in this country, but we do have a, a few examples that have been recovered over the years. Uh, and this particular one has been found in London. Um, and there are also pipes that are marked IF that have these X's at either end of them and also occur on a little border across the stem. Now, these marks aren't found in Bristol, um, and in London we don't find those Bristol marks with the geometric borders. So I think we can be pretty sure that these marks, we don't know who was making them, but the I, um, IF um, I and the AA and one or two other marks that turn up on these export styles um, are being made in London for the export market. And um, this mark has been recorded from a number of sites uh, in Maryland and Virginia. So we know that they were being shipped across the Atlantic. So although the bowl form is, is pretty much the same, it's a case of looking at the mark itself and the style of the mark, um, which will help give you clues as to where it might have been made. As I say, in this case, even if we don't know who the, the maker is. And this same export style um, carried on being used right through into the 19th century um, and in association with some of the other types of decoration we've seen. So here um, are some examples of these armorial pipes with the Prince of Wales feathers uh, and the um, Hanoverian arms or sometimes their, their later arms that have been used. <coughs> and they're used in conjunction here with a typical London style of stem mark, but again on a spurless bowl form uh, that is intended purely for export and we don't find these uh, in England but uh, they have turned up on sites in America and these particular ones have come from Bermuda because they've got some quite nice examples uh, that have been found from there. So if we look at um, one or two of the little groups from um, the States, uh, these pipes here come from the Jordan Farrer site and um, the top ones have these, these very, very curved bowl form 
and this tells us that they're coming from the southwest of England somewhere and they have on them the gauntlet mark and as I sort of mentioned briefly earlier um, the gauntlet family were famous pipe makers uh, it was their surname and they used the gauntlet device as a mark um, in, in the start of the 17th century and they became so famous for their pipes that the mark was quite widely pirated and then it gradually became known as a, a pattern name for pipes uh, as we saw in the Bristol um, list that we were looking at from 1710. But um, alongside the um, the gauntlet marks. Um, there's a mark here which is a TG mark. <clears throat> now the um, the bowl form's not shown, but the mark with this little fleur de lis above and below is very recognisable. And this was made by Tamsin Garland, who was a, a female pipe maker working in Barnstable down in the southwest um, of England. And so again, it's one of these smaller ports where there's a bit of pipe making um, be going on. Uh, and if we can recognise the marks, uh, then we can start to see in much finer detail where pipes are being traded from uh, to the new world. The TH mark, um, I'm not sure who the TH actually was, but the style of the mark with these little um, dashed lines above and below it uh, is very typical of pipes from, Lon <coughs> from London. And so you can, you can see by looking at the marks here, we've got a, a range of different um, production centres represented uh, just from the style of the marks and the bowl form. Now also from London um, we find marks which have the uh, a little crown above. Um, I think I forgot to point out earlier when we're looking at some of those armorial pipes from the Tower of London uh, there was a WM pipe from there which had this um, crown above and so if you find initials with a crown or sometimes um, here we've got Irish harps with a, a crown above and sometimes you find stars with a crown above these are all marks that are typical of London and so if you find that style of marking uh, you know straight away that you're getting one of the pipes that are, are coming from from London. So if we just take a, a selection of assorted pipes that come from various sites in the Chesapeake Bay area, um, when you look at them initially, most of them aren't marked um, and they look a bit unprepossessing. But um, if you start to look at them individually, uh, you can start to work out where these pipes are coming from and that gives you a lot more information about the where the, the trade is, is coming from to particular sites. So if we break them down, um, there's some from the Jamestown Fort excavations at the top here. Um, this little one, although it looks very small, is actually a miniature pipe. Um, and these were made as novelties during the, well, the, well, for quite a period during the 17th century from maybe the 1630s and 40s onwards through to about the 1680s or 90s. So it could be from almost any period uh, in the 17th century, but it's a little miniature one. Um, and this is a typical form, a very early form of pipe from London. And that's hardly surprising because we know that a lot of the um, financial backing for the Jamestown settlement was coming from the city. So uh, a lot of pipes came from there. But then the other pipes, if we look at um, this particular form here with this very sinuous upright um, bowl style, and the same with this one down here, um, these are both forms that are typical of Exeter um, in South Devon. And so although the pipes aren't marked, um, we can almost be certain that these have come from Devon and they represent another production centre. Um, and the pipes from Exeter are very rarely marked. Um, there's very large numbers have come from excavations there and hardly any of them have maker's marks, but the bowl form is quite distinctive. And so we've got some pipes coming from uh, the Southwest this example here um, has a little single letter H mark on it. And again, this, this mark is very distinctive and comes from the Poole Harbour area um, in central southern England, sort of near the Isle of Wight. So again, we've got another production centre represented once you can start to recognise the, the different marks and bowl forms that are uh, being used. Whereas this form here, um, also plain and unmarked, but is a, a typical London form. So um, you can see different, different production centres um, coming out. Uh, and the same with these other ones that were on that first um, slide. 
Um, this particular very bulbous form here is very typical of pipes from Yorkshire. And that's quite unusual because that's on the east side of England uh, and it's not a normal um, area that pipes are coming from to the New World. Uh, this pipe has an almost unrecognizable mark, but it is in fact one of those little castle marks. And again, the bowl form is distinctive. So we know that this is, comes from Scotland. Um, whereas this one here has a rather baggy sort of bowl form and is typical of pipes that are found in Ireland. And so I suspect this was picked up from Southern Ireland um, as they were picking up final supplies before the transatlantic crossing. Uh, and this one has the little ridges on the heel, which shows it comes from Chester. So um, the, the collection of pipes that didn't look very exciting can actually uh, tell you a lot about where people are traveling from uh, to to get to the uh, the new world and the research is carrying on so i just thought i'd um, uh, finish off by showing you um one of the latest society for clay pipe, pipe research newsletters this is the the last issue that came out uh, at the end of last year and in it was a paper um on pipes uh from uh, the rappahannock river area two different sites um where pipes have been found and these particular pipes are, are quite interesting because they're not ones that turn up very frequently uh, in the Chesapeake area. Um, but again, if you remember the pipes we were looking at from Merseyside um, with the maker's name through the middle uh, and these little serrated borders and then sort of heart shaped or little triangular motifs at the edge. And this is a very distinctive uh, mark. Um, the maker is, is Elizabeth Savage. Um, and unfortunately, we don't know where she was made, um, working, um, but the style of the mark is absolutely clear that, you know, this style comes from the northwest. Uh, it's most common in Rainford. It was also used in Liverpool and one or two of the other surrounding areas. So we can be sure that this maker was working in the northwest of England. Uh, and this one has now turned up from the site of Corbin Hall. Um, and if we look at some parallels from England, um, these are from Warrington and Lancaster, which are both um, up in the northwest. And you can see other examples of the same mark turning up on stems from that area uh, to show that uh, she was making pipes there. But they were also finding their way across the Atlantic, uh, probably through Liverpool. And then these two decorated stems have turned up from the Rose Gill Plantation site. Um, and they're, again, immediately recognisable as Chester stems because they've got these decorative borders. Um, you can see the tendril um, borders running around here. Um, this one's got uh, hearts and stars and things on it. And then they're flanking ovals. Um, this one has the initials AR for Queen Anne. Um, and this one has the Talbot um, symbol, which is uh, one of the local families in the Chester area uh, with the Talbots, and that was their motif, the little Talbot dog um, standing there. So um, straight away, you can recognise these as early 18th century stems from Chester, uh, which have then turned up uh, on one of the plantation sites. So uh, if you if you know what the, the pipes um, are telling you, you can you can interpret them a lot better. So I'll just leave you finally with one that um, comes from the Liverpool area again, one of these large um, Liberty uh, and American Eagle pipes. Uh, it's much bigger than normal and uh, again made specifically for the, the export market. So uh, I hope that's given you an idea of what you can do with pipes and a bit about um, the different styles of pipe that are made in Britain and how they um, are relevant to you uh, in America. Uh, and if you want any further um, information and contacts. Um, I've put some uh, useful notes up here. There's the the National Pipe Archive is based at the University of Liverpool, um, and they have a, a useful website, and that includes quite a lot of resources, uh, and it's arranged geographically, so it, it shows a, a map of Britain. There's a, a sort of key map that you click on, and that will provide lists of different known pipe makers from each area, um, as well as a number of, of resources that have been digitised that you can browse on the site. Um, and there are also some guidelines on dealing with pipes from excavations, how to um, excavate, record and process pipes uh, can all be found on that website. The Society for Clay Pipe Research publishes um, a newsletter that that um, last article we looked at was taken from. And again, uh, you can look on the Society website 
where quite a number of newsletters have been digitized um, or if you're a Facebook user there's a very active Facebook group where people post um, pipes they found and um, have queries and things answered on there uh, and then there's the Academy Internationale de la Pipe which is um, an international organization that covers a wide range of pipes. Um, they look as well as clay pipes at briar pipes and meerschaum pipes and other types of pipe. But again, the journal that is published uh, includes a number of um, useful articles. And I think it's um, volume two of the journal, which is again is available on their website, uh, includes a summary of pipe production in America, um, as well as a number of other countries that were, were put in to that um, particular volume. So uh, uh, that's worth looking at. Uh, and then uh, there's me. Uh, if you have any other queries that aren't covered above, uh, you can email me uh, or look on uh, my academia site where there are quite a lot of my um, articles are available. So uh, I hope that's been uh, useful to you and uh, thank you for your attention. No, thank you, Dr. Higgins. Um, can you unshare and we'll come back together? Um, if you can hang with us for a little bit, we, do have, we do, do have some questions um, in the chat box that I have been uh, collecting along the way. I also heard uh, a little birdie tell me that Lisa Kraus um, had wanted to ask you an ID question. So let's start off with that, Lisa, if you want. Right. I, um, I hope you will forgive me for being terribly lazy about this. Uh, I believe we have looked for this pipe and I hope you can see it. it's a little dark here in my living room. Uh, this is uh, a pipe from the Cockers Houses site in Baltimore. I expect uh, a relatively common 19th century type, which uh, I know that things get a lot more diverse. Um, so let's see if I can, uh, where's my camera? It has a horse. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. You've seen this before? <laughs> yeah, that's it's, it's um, a Dutch pipe. That's the Friesland horse. Um, I think, can you see on the on the seam, are there some little serrated dashes sort of where the seam has been trimmed? Has it got some little diagonal lines across it? Yes. Um, it that, that's one of these little characteristic things you need to look for. If you find a serrated trimming seam like that, um, it, it's a, a continental pipe, normally from uh, the Netherlands or from France, um, because they, they used a particular trimming tool there, and you don't find that on English pipes. But that particular motif is, is the Friesland horse. It's um, one of the popular designs there. So uh, that's a Dutch pipe. And they, it, sometimes they have a maker's mark underneath the heel. Is there a little stamp underneath it at all? Or, or it's missing, is it, the heel? It's missing the heel. It's, it's missing. Stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's uh, so that's what that that one is. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was so easy. That's exactly what I was hoping would happen. <laughs> this, All right. Uh, there was we're, another we're doing, one. Of these. We're doing archaeology on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there was there were several of those that were found. Uh, oh, it was at Benedict. Okay, Benedict uh, down in Charles County. Um, Maryland. It, yeah, no, I know it was in Maryland, but was it uh, at the, the Benedict site? The, I think so. Okay. We found a couple of those in Maryland lately, so that's that's good to know. I don't think they've been identified. Well, that was convenient. Thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Higgins, we have some questions in the chat box. A lot of them have to do with, a, with general design and also manufacture of um, um, of the pipe. So they want people wanting to know how they were made, especially when you put an order in for 600,000, you know, what was the manufacturing process of that? Um, there's also questions about the design of them being so small and, I mean, so skinny um, and what the, what the heel was used for. Um, was it, did it serve a purpose? Did people put it on a table and use it to stand up on? Um, and and how how long would a pipe like that last in somebody's possession before they'd have to buy another one? So there's right. a lot of a lot of ones around there. Okay, um, right. Well, pipes, yeah, they're they pipes are made in in metal molds. Um, so they're it's it's a slightly different um, type of ceramic manufacturing from most other sort of ceramics. Um, the you have a, a metal mold in um, England, it's normally made of cast iron. A lot of the ones in Europe are made of brass. Um, and the 
clay is first of all um, after it's been prepared you make a roll of clay which is roughly the right size for the pipe um, that uh, that you're making that has to then be allowed to dry a bit until it's firmed up and become a bit stiffer and you then um, have a metal rod that you then poke down the middle of the stem to make the stem bore uh, you sort of have to feed the clay onto it and it's actually it's not quite as difficult as it sounds you can feel where the end of the wire is uh, and the end of the wire was hammered over slightly to make it slightly thicker um, just with the bird over end uh, and that enables the wire to move through the clay more easily so you push the wire down till it's nearly down the the length of the stem uh, and then the pipe is put into the metal mold which is oiled to prevent adhesion from the clay um, the oh uh, <laughs> my my assistant has kindly um, just fished out a mold here is a, a pipe mold um, this is a, a, a cast iron mold for making a, a pipe with a, a football design on you can see a football boot and ball underneath uh, the mold comes in in two halves so you've got the two um, two halves you put the the clay roll be put inside the um, this section the two halves are put together um, and there, there are metal pins you can see uh, metal pins on the uh, mold which engage and hold it in the right position and then there's a third piece um, which is called the stopper uh, and this has the bowl cavity shape um, in it and there's a, a press that it goes into and this stopper is suspended on a, a lever arm and is forced down into the top of the mold like that and as it goes down the clay is forced to take up the shape of the pipe inside and spare clay is extruded at the top and then uh, you trim across the top with a knife uh, on English pipes. Dutch are slightly different, they had an open top uh, and they finished them differently at the rim um, but the English ones right from the 17th century had this slot arrangement for trimming at the top of the bowl uh, and you can then open the mold up as soon as the pipe is molded uh, and take it out and you slide it off the wire uh, and leave it to dry until it's firmed up a bit more and then you put another wire back down it to clear the bore again um, to support it while you're trimming it and you have to trim the seams because obviously you get um, a certain amount of clays extruded between the two halves of the mold so that's that's basically the process by which you you make the pipe um, but of course it the, this is why um, you have to be very careful about measuring stem bores because the the wire used initially has got the end hammered over and basically the the pipe maker hammers the end over to make the bore bigger so it goes in easily and over time that soon wears down and every now and then he has to take the wire and hammer it again to make it bigger again so that the the size hole um, changes according to how recently the end of the wire has been hammered uh, and then when you slide the second wire down doing the trimming it can then distort and change the, the size of the hole and if you measure if you find a, a pipe that's broken into sections that join you often find that you get different measurements at different um, sections along it so the, the hole isn't always a very uniform um, thing so that's the um, essentially how they were produced uh, then what was the what was the sorry, next <laughs> the next bit to move on to what was the little uh, the knob on oh, the underneath? Yeah, the um, there's a, a lot of uh, I think a, a lot of uh, nonsense has been written about this. There's been people saying, "Oh, it's when polished furniture came in and it kept the bowls off, so they didn't burn the furniture and all this sort of thing." Um, but I think this is this is um, uh, doesn't have any grounding in in any sort of documentary or historical fact um, and if you look at the engravings and things like I, I started with paintings and engravings people um, held the pipe when they were smoking it these long pipes um, there's such a lot of leverage on them you wouldn't want to try and hold it in your mouth and have it dangling around loose you, you hold the stem of the pipe to take the weight of it and when a pipe is not in use it's it's shown lying on its side so um, I don't think the, the there's any significance uh, I think it it's simply comes down to style that the pipe makers were making different styles of pipe and some people liked having a big flat heel some liked having a pointed spur and some didn't like having either and so these export pipes um, don't have either the heel or spur on them um, but it doesn't you know the pipe makers could make them any way you wanted uh, and if you look at the the lists like the Bristol list of all the patterns they were making they they say on oh, no, you know we can make any pattern pipe you want for 
anywhere. Uh, and different parts of the country uh, in England, you find some parts of the country only made heel pipes at certain periods. Sometimes they only made spur pipes, but it, it just seems to be a local a local fashion. It's what uh, what people like. So I don't think there's any significance. It's it's uh, a fashion a fashion thing, uh, not a, a practical thing. Uh, and the yeah, third how topic. How, how, how fast oh, does how, one? Yeah. It's it's very difficult to be absolutely sure um, certainly from the 19th century we have an account of someone who used to sit and he had two boxes of pipes on either side of the fire and he would take a new one out of the box to smoke it um, and when he smoked he'd just snap it in half and throw it in the box on the other side so um, <clears throat> his his um, life expectancy was just one smoke um, pipes they were incredibly fragile uh, and they they broke very easily, and, and once they were broken, I think they were they were largely discarded, uh, unless you're in a, a what you might call a stressed situation. Um, I've looked at some groups of pipes that have come from prisons. There was um, a nice prison group that was found from down at Rochester in Kent in this country, uh, and a number of the pipes there had clearly been reused in a broken state because you could see either teeth marks on the stem or they'd been whittled to make them short and they were reusing broken pipes. But if you've got a, a good supply of pipes, this very rarely happens. You very rarely find evidence for reuse. I mean, basically, the pipe came the length you wanted it. If you wanted a long pipe, you bought a long pipe. If you wanted a short pipe, you bought a short pipe and you smoked them um, in that form. You, you, If it broke a little bit off, you might smoke it a bit, but basically if it was broken, you chucked it away. And um, if you find good um, rubbish pits where everything's gone in, you can often reconstruct the pipes and find that they, they're, you know, all the bits are there. They weren't smoking them in, in um, sections. It, the whole thing goes in. Um, and the only, um, the, I suppose, one one way of looking at it, the, the, there is a, a reference from a slaving ship um, where they were buying provisions for the voyage from Africa to America, and they were buying pipes um, for the slaves. So, I mean, the, the, they were part of the... Um, the, the manifest for the ship what they, they were buying and if I remember correctly it worked out at 6.4 pipes per person or per slave that was being carried so even even when they were catering for slaves as part of their um, sort of provisions for the journey they allowed 6.4 pipes for the the crossing so um, they and presumably they were right at the bottom of the pile so you know they, they weren't going to be getting any special treatment but they still reckon they needed six pipes to to last for the the journey uh, and certainly um, most pipes I think had a life expectancy that could probably be measured in in, in days um, or maybe a couple of weeks at tops you know that they they didn't last long uh, and they were one of the first really disposable types of object and this is really why they're so useful archaeologically because when you find them you can be pretty sure they they were discarded very close to their date of manufacture and because you can often work out who made them and where they were made and when they were made um, that gives you a really good uh, insight into the deposits that you're looking at great now, a couple of other ones on that, kind of the same bend. Uh, people want to know how they were carried around. Did people walk around with them? Did they have a little pouch for them? And and I think that you kind of covered this. They, people were wondering if they were cleaned, like with a pipe cleaner and reused. Yeah. The, um, I think the, the answer to that, it, it varies a bit according to what you're doing. Um, when you see traveling pictures of traveling people sort of paintings and engravings of travelers uh, they often have a pipe tucked in their hat band or whatever so they will sort of tuck it into a hat or somewhere where it's obviously not going to get um, crushed against you when you're you're moving around um, and this may well be why the shorter pipes uh, were favored um, you know maybe in the plantations where it's easier to carry a, a short eight and a half inch Jamaica um, pipe uh, or Virginia pipe, rather than uh, one of the longer church warden types that were um, smoked in other situations. And probably if you if you went to the 
a tavern in the evening, you might well have had a longer pipe um, because that was a more of a, a recreational environment where you could smoke a, a longer pipe without it being damaged. And if you were working in the fields, you might take a shorter pipe because it was more uh, easy to carry around. And certainly in the 19th century, when you get these very short cutty pipes, um, we know that the Irish navvies um, favoured these really short stocky pipes with thick stems because they could put them in their pocket and carry them around and they wouldn't break so easily. So um, I think you probably chose your pipe a bit according to where you were. Um, and in regard to sort of cleaning and reusing of them, um, a lot of taverns would supply pipes that in the same way that if you go into a tavern and, and order some beer, they'll give you a glass to drink it from. Um, if you went and bought tobacco, they'd give you a pipe to smoke it in. So the, the, the taverns would often have pipes and they often acted as um, sort of hardware shops anyway. You'd often get groceries and things at the taverns as well. So it may not have been necessary to carry pipes all the time. You, you know, you might simply get one um, at the point where you were going to be smoking you know if that's in a tavern or whatever um and then a lot of taverns would have um what was called a pipe kiln which was um three iron hoops with um, horizontal bars holding them together and at the end of the day they would collect up any pipes that hadn't got broken uh, put them in the pipe kiln and then stand that in the embers of the fire and the hot embers of the fire would burn off all the residue from smoking the tobacco um and clean the pipes and they'd come out white again but you had to do it and the embers when it died down so you didn't get smoky uh, discoloration uh, on the pipes. So certainly we, we know that um, you know landlords would recycle pipes and reburn them to clean them and sometimes you find accounts as well of pipe makers taking used pipes back that they would have um, pipes sent back to them for reburning they just put them back in the kiln again and refire them and again they would come out clean. Uh, and occasionally you find um, if you've got a particularly thrifty town council and you've got the council minutes and things, you sometimes find an, a, an account for reburning pipes. They've obviously been smoking them at their meetings and then sent them back to the pipe maker for reburning. So there was a, to a degree, they were reused if they hadn't got broken uh, and you could, you could clean them simply by burning them in a fire and that would get rid of any residue that had uh, gummed up the, the stem bore. Okay, going on, a, if you're still with us, we're going on a little bit of a different uh, subject matter. Bruce wanted to know, are there maps showing the distribution of the found um, artifacts associated with the pipes um, that show the different model or manufacturer? So showing where they were found and the manufacturer. Uh, not uh not really i mean there are there are one or two there are some studies from england that um are showing the distribution of um pipes um that i think the one the one of the last um international pipe academy journals uh had a paper that was looking at um, the movement of pipes through into wales um coming from uh, english production centers so that there has been some work on um plotting those but um I can't think of any for the states um, offhand, but certainly uh, that's certainly the sort of thing that would be very useful to do. And there's, there's plenty of potential for doing that. Um, there's uh, you know enough data I think has now been collected. It's a case of someone getting out there and actually um, collating all the information and uh, you know doing something with it. But yeah, that that certainly would be a very useful thing to do. Okay, that sounds like a good project. Um, Hedy wants to know: Can you date a pipe? Stem by borehole size. Um, <laughs> uh, not not um, not amazingly accurately, I think. Um, the, you, the the obviously there are various formulas that have been developed, particularly in America, for for dating assemblages. Um, but the the caveat is often that you need to have a very large group of stems to get a, a reliable reading, uh, and the. I think the view of a lot of English archaeologists is that by the time you've got that many stems, you ought to have an, enough bits of bowl or marks and decoration that you can actually get a better idea of what's going on by studying those rather than relying on the, the stem bore's hole itself. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that it works in broad terms um, during the, the 17th and into the, the start of the 18th century. It breaks down a bit after that because the, uh, the bore's... Um, don't change so much and uh, there's also a question because th there hasn't been much work in the Netherlands the, the Dutch don't measure stem bores uh, and 
Dutch pipes, I think, have different stem bores to English pipes. So again, um, that's not a problem for us in this country because we get very few Dutch pipes here, but where you get mixed assemblages with Dutch pipes and English pipes, that could well be a factor um, that's going to influence, uh, you know, if you're doing lots of readings and trying to work out a date. Um, and a lot of the studies that have, have used stem bore dating end up with a caveat at the end saying, um, oh, well, this date's a bit earlier than we thought it should be because, and there's sort of some reason is given as to, to, to why that is. So um, my personal view is that you're, you're better to stick to looking at the attributes of the pipe rather than spending a lot of time measuring the stem bores, um, although th th they can have their uses. For example, if you've got a lot of, of um, plow zone material that you're looking at and you want to look at distributions um, across a site, that's a, a, a useful thing because it's something you can measure if you've only got small broken fragments. So there are there are uses for it. But in terms of dating, um, I would say they're, they're useful to give a broad indication, but they're not going to give you the, the refinement you can get from looking at the, the bowl forms and the maker's marks. Okay. Um, Jeff wants to know about reproductions. He says that they've been made for a long time. How can you tell fake from original? Yeah, it's an <laughs> it's interesting um, term because some people uh, refer to them as, as fakes. Um, Basically, they're clay pipes. I mean, either people are making them or they're not. Um, the most molds had a, a limited life. I mean, the when they were making, using them for making pipes, I mean, a, a pipe maker was making hundreds of pipes a day out of these molds and they did get worn, um, particularly around the edges. You need to have really sharp edges on the mold to get a clean um, pipe out of it. And so um, the molds were changed quite regularly and particularly uh, in the Netherlands where they're using brass as a material because that wears more quickly than the iron that was being used here. But most, most molds don't didn't have a very long life and also the fashions changed um very quickly you know you're, you're getting these the stylistic changes and the decorative changes so most pipes um the molds probably didn't last you know more than a few years um now what, what has happened as the industry has gone into decline um because i think there was a question that came up as well about when pipe making finished um the, the there were changes, particularly in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, with the development of um, cigarette rolling machines. So I think it, I think it's around the 1880s that you get patents for cigarette rolling machines, which completely revolutionised the the cost of cigarettes. That the, the machines could turn out vast numbers of cigarettes much more cheaply than the hand rolled ones that had been used before. Um, and then there was also a shift towards new materials. Um, briar pipes in particular came in around the middle of the 19th century. And so they were more durable, they didn't break as easily. And they were, again, it was fashionable that you had these new styles of pipe coming in. So we, we find towards the second half of the, the 19th century, um, the, um, the, the production of clay pipes tends to start to decline and certainly when you get through into the early 20th century um, th there's quite a big decline going on they're, they're becoming much fewer and further between and then production does carry on um, where there's still one or two people uh, making pipes today and of course what they're tending to use are the old molds that, that date from the the late 19th early 20th century and so this probably is where this question about um, reproductions comes in but in a sense they're they, you could say they're <coughs> reproductions in the sense that they're, they're they're modern ones, but if they're made in the old metal moulds, they're just the same um, as they've always been. Uh, and in fact, the the last firm to make commercially in this country um, sold the business in 1990 to a snuff manufacturer who still makes a few pipes, um, and they were still using some Victorian moulds there. But the, those moulds, some of them had been in production more or less continuously um, since that since that date. So. Um, you know, some of some of them, some of them are brought back into use, and so they might be. Um, you might want to call them reproductions. Um, the only other type of reproduction is when people then make plaster molds and they try slip casting, um, which is a different technique and gives you a different a different finish. Um, and the um, I think the tavern pipe that Ilka showed at the beginning is a slip cast pipe. Um, it's made at the Williamsburg Pottery um, and they're sold in large numbers at Williamsburg, you know, as, as tourist souvenirs. Um, but they're actually made by a slightly different technique than the um, pressing them in metal moulds, which was the traditional technique. 
Um, we, Sharon, what, Sharon finds one inch long pieces along the Chesapeake Bay and it's what's you know, this, this just how the stems break or is there truth to the rumor that pipes were shared and tips broke off for less passing of germs? <laughs> they, well, again, that, that story is, it, it tends to get passed around an awful lot. Um, but in all the years I've been looking at pipes, I've never found any um, documentation to suggest it, that that actually happened. Uh, and so I, I think I'll put that as an old wives tale that has become promoted and it, it, it sort of people like to think, oh, yes, that's a, you know, a nice hygienic way of doing it. Um, but there, there's no evidence at all that people ever did that in the past. So I think that's uh, a, uh, a, a modern fallacy. It's not, uh, not based on any historical uh, evidence for it. Um, and we also wanted to know what your favorite pipe um, was. Do you Ooh. have a favorite? Do I have a favorite pipe? I, there, there are so many. I mean, it's... Uh, um, or a favorite pipe maker. A favorite pipe maker. <sighs> um... Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, you know, the Dutch made some quite nice pipes, but we don't always like to admit that the Dutch are making nice pipes. But uh, um, I think, I guess I, I like the armorial pipes. The the 18th century um, armorials from London are some of my favourites. So uh, they're, they're, they're quite nice. Um, and so, uh, but uh, I've, I have very wide interest in pipes. So um, I, I do quite a lot of work on ethnographic pipes as well. And so, uh, some of the higher pipes from the Northwest Pacific uh, I particularly like, so, but that's a completely different, completely different topic, so. <laughs> well, how did you get into pipes and do you, do you smoke pipes? Uh, no, I, I don't smoke pipes. Um, I've, I've, I've never been a smoker. Um, I, I always blame my grandparents uh, because I was, I was all, always interested in archaeology and uh, when I was uh, very little, uh, you know, I used to go around their allotment. They had a little allotment garden at the back of their house <clears throat> and I'd collect bits of pottery and glass and pipe and stuff from there. Um, and I can always remember them telling me that these were pipes, these things I was finding. Uh, but I could never figure out how you could get gas or electricity through these pipes. They kept saying they were pipes and I could never figure out how they work. Uh, and then, of course, eventually the penny dropped that they weren't uh, service pipes. They were, were smoking pipes. Uh, and someone kindly bought me many years ago uh, a, a copy of one of the early papers on pipes um, because they, you know, I was interested in collecting these bits and it's just sort of um, grown from there. So I just, uh, I guess I always became interested in them and uh, ended up studying them. And uh, so it's uh, become a bit of a thing. So yeah, I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> certainly glad that you uh, that you were and that you did and that you that you are because um, we're we uh, learned so much from you. Ilka, do you have anything else to add for um, Dr. Higgins? Just want to thank you so much again for presenting to us. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, what do you know if the Society of Clay Pipe Research is going to have their annual meeting in Williamsburg next year? No, I mean, unfortunately, COVID put paid to that. We were really looking forward to to coming across and having a meeting in the States because we, we have quite a number of members in the States. Uh, and so we thought it would be nice to, to have a meeting over there because um, one or two of them come over um, regularly for meetings in this country. But uh, um, and we were all geared up for that. But obviously, with the COVID um, situation, that that unfortunately didn't come off. Um, and I guess we'll just have to see how it pans out because uh, things are still a bit up in the air at the moment. And obviously, uh, it takes quite a lot of planning to try to get an international conference fixed up. And uh, whether we'll manage to get it off the ground again or not, I don't know. But uh, we will we'll look into it and uh, we'll let you know if <laughs> if it manages to get it going again. Okay, well, thank you so very much, especially since it's so late um, where you are to, uh, to talk to us so knowledgeably about this topic. So thank you yes. again. No problem. I'm, uh, I hope it was of some interest and uh, it'll inspire you to go and look at your pipes and you, so. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe, um, stay well, stay curious and uh, keep looking and seeing what we're, we have going on at the Natural History Society. We hope to see you in person soon. There's lots going on. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.